challenges that they face when they organize, what happens when images of their struggles in organizing travel across borders. So today we have two distinguished speakers with us. We have um, Taslima Akhtar, who is a labor rights organizer and photographer from Bangladesh. She also coordinates a grassroots labor organizing group called Bangladesh Garment Workers Solidarity, and she is also a lecturer of photojournalism at the Patshala, the South Asian Media Institute located in Bangladesh. So Taslima com combines our grassroots social, act so social justice activism with documentary photography. The Time magazine selected Taslima's photo, the final embrace as one of the top 10 photos of the year 2013. And her work has been exhibited in many countries, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and China. And we also have um, the pleasure of having Professor Elora Choudhury with us. And um, she is the professor and chair of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Professor Choudhury's research and teaching interests include transnational feminisms, critical development studies, gender violence, and narrative and film with a specific emphasis on South Asia. And she is also the current vice president of the National Women's Studies Association. So before the panel discussion begins, we will be watching a 25 minute, minute long documentary that talks about the very complex nature of the transnational apparel supply chain. And the documentary shows how this entire supply chain is really, really complex and how it was intentionally made very complex so that it can shield transnational corporations, so that it becomes really difficult to find out who can be held responsible when an industrial disaster happens. So let's watch this documentary first, and then we will start our panel discussion. It 
experienced the deadliest factory fire in its history. Walmart shorts were among the clothes found in the charred remains. But the company escaped accountability. And for many Western retailers whose clothes are made in Bangladesh, it's business as usual. Anybody out there know how many zeros are in half a trillion dollars? Thank you for the numbers guy for a while. The fire at the Pazreen Fashions factory last November started on the ground floor and quickly spread. At least 112 people died. Hundreds of others were injured. Many workers were trapped inside because the doors were locked and the building had no fire exits. The remains of the fire are still everywhere here. This is where workers jumped out of the burning building onto the roof of this dormitory. With bars and all the windows, the workers had to kick out of the exhaust fans and jump onto this building. Rukia Begum's daughter, Hina, died in the fire. Many of the women who escaped the fire still live in the shadow of the factory. Muktabano is one of them. She said she was sewing the Walmart shorts when the fire broke out. When word got out that we were visiting, other survivors came to share their stories. So you put the heading along the zipper and the belt. How about you? None of the women received any compensation from Walmart. So we had the factory. And they all vowed to never work at a garment factory again. Do you know what kind of these pair of shorts were for? Five months after the fire, yet another disaster in Bangladesh captured the world's attention. Rana Plaza, an eight-story building housing several garment factories, collapsed. More than a thousand people died. Even though the scale of the collapse eclipsed the fire, the fundamental questions raised by Tazreen were the same. How could tragedies like this happen, and who, ultimately, should be held responsible? Before we arrived in Bangladesh, we received internal documents related to the Walmart Shorts order. The paper trail gives us an inside look into the complicated way that Walmart produces its clothing. Walmart is a pioneer and also the most ruthless practitioner of a sourcing model that is now going to dominate the apparel industry. It's a system that can shield the company from blame when disaster strikes. Walmart's supply chain is defined by two critical features. The tremendous pressure Walmart puts on its suppliers and contract factories overseas to slash production costs. So Walmart knows those factories will be by doing the rights and safety workers. And then secondly, the utilization of multiple layers of agents and contractors so that Walmart can distance itself from responsibility for the inevitable consequences of those sourcing practices. Simco is a mid-sized garment factory in a neighborhood crowded with them. At its height, it had 1,500 workers. Today, there are 600. Simco is where the shorts were supposed to have been made. Walmart 
placed the order with a New York-based supplier called Success Apparel. Success Apparel then filled it with Simcoe with help from a local buying agent called True Colors. So this was from Success Apparel? Yeah, there's a contract and you can see this is the price and the quantity, complete thousand, which is like 337,000 pieces. Nowhere it is mentioned that this is a Walmart product. But, sir, if you see the devil, China, the LG, LG is the faded glory. Faded Glory is Walmart's main in-house clothing line. And it was that brand of shorts that was found in the ashes of the Tazreen factory fire. Simco says it couldn't handle the order after dozens of workers who left town during the Muslim holiday of Eid didn't return on time. So already we were overbooked, we were over our capacity and suddenly we don't have the workers to fulfill, fulfill the orders on time. Kevin Paxton, the CEO of Success Apparel, he visited us, and he was like going to our uh, facilities, oh yeah, the production, it's, you know, he used to pull other words, etc. And then he's like, and we told him like, you know, we're having like trouble meeting the deadline, you know, we need some extensions, we need some help. We are very upset. He said, not the senior the extension they can give us. So he said, find the top contract. That's how much. To the Walmart supplier. Yeah. Direct supplier to Walmart. Came here and told you something. Yes. Yes, yes. Subcontracting means paying another factory to take on some of the work. Simcoe was already stretched thin dealing with the shorts. Then it was hit with yet another massive order. And then we've got this other document from Public Clothing Company, and that's another Walmart supplier. Oh, uh, Walmart supplier. And they've sent a purchase order for almost 300,000 shorts. Yes. Another set of shorts. August 17th. August 17th. Three days later. Yes. Simco can make around 300,000 garments a month. Put together, the two Walmart orders were more than double its capacity. I guess the logic was you put the order and somehow the factory will fulfill it. Somehow the factory will fulfill it. What is that code for? Uh, that's called for like, yes, we do subcontracting if we give it to other lines, other production lines to fulfill the order. Did Walmart know about your production capacity here? Yes, Walmart does third party audits. So the auditors come and they count your machines. So they know exactly how many garments you can produce on average on the line. Given what happened in Tazreen, some have asked why Simco didn't simply refuse the second Walmart order. Factories in place like Bangladesh are engaged in cutthroat competition with competitors in Bangladesh and around the world. So it's practically impossible to turn down a major order from Walmart because that is the factory's livelihood. So to meet Walmart's deadline, Simcoe subcontracted a small part of the success apparel order to a manufacturer called Tuba. Tuba then sent the shorts to its Tazreen factory. A few weeks later, the factory caught fire. Oh my God. Don't believe. Don't believe. You know, I could, couldn't believe how can that happen. I don't know. So <clears throat> I called Kevin, you know, and I said, look, Kevin, the factory, you know, got fired. He got mad, you know, and so what happened with the factory? So he didn't say somebody to get our things out. Success Apparel accused Simco of subcontracting the order without their knowledge. And Walmart blamed their supplier, Success. But Simco insists that Success knew about Tazreen, and that Walmart also would have known because its own database, Retail Link, requires suppliers to identify where orders are being filled. Retail Link is supposed to have a record of every factory authorized to produce Walmart goods, every factory engaged in the production of Walmart goods. In May, Walmart named over 240 factories it would no longer work with saying it had a zero-tolerance policy for unauthorized subcontracting. Simco was one of them. If there was no choice on the Tazreen, then the business would have gone on. It's like, everybody knows what's going on. It's an open secret. But getting caught on camera is, or I think, in the act, then you have to disown everything and say, I don't know anything about it. That this is the practice of Walmart. 
to hide, you know, do not carry contact. So he has to supply the vendors. And every factory is in my own with our customers. Everybody. Facing a scandal, Walmart refused to accept the shorts or to pay the bill, even after some of the order had already been shipped. And this is our entirely uh, abandoned port. Out $1.2 million, Simco says it's nearly bankrupt. So all of these shorts were made in these production lines. And I really feel that uh, when I don't see our workers in these production lines, some of whom they have been with us for like 24, 25 years, you know, and all these machines are now empty. After the Tazreen fire, Walmart announced it had dropped Success Apparel as a supplier. We tried to speak to Success's representative in Bangladesh, but we found the company had closed down its office here. We also tried to interview the company's CEO, Gila Goodman, in New York, but she refused to speak with us. Kevin Taxon, who was Success's president at the time of the fire, also refused to speak to us on camera. He now heads up another supplier called America Group. One of its clients is Walmart. If Walmart were really so upset about what Success Apparel did, one assumes they would not be keen to continue to do business with a leading executive from Success Apparel. On the phone, Kevin told us that neither Success nor its agent in Bangladesh, True Colors, knew about the subcontract to Tazreen. But we managed to track down True Colors' last remaining employee in Dhaka. If there's any subcontract, can you be aware of that? Yeah. And then what do you do with that information? Do you pass it up? Yeah, we pass it up to our employer. Can you read this email for me and tell me who it's from? Okay, this is saying hi, Tanta. I heard the shocking news about the fire last day in it. It is now 26. And what's the subject line of the email? Fire and subcon. Subcon is industry speak for subcontractor. That email was sent by a manager in True Colors shortly after the fire. So despite Success's denials, their own agent may have been aware of the subcontract of Hazri. We're on the trail investigating how Walmart's supply chain works here in Bangladesh. Does the company know when its orders are being subcontracted? Is the way they source their clothing, the system itself, flawed? The garment industry is notoriously secretive, so we needed an insider. We're on our way to need an auditor. It's hired by Walmart to assess standards in some of its factories. It's very rare for auditors to speak on the record, and he doesn't want to speak to us on camera. So we recorded the conversation secretly. In Bangladesh, government regulation of garment factories is lax, and international companies are not legally required to ensure working conditions are safe. Some companies hire auditors to inspect the factories. There's a reason 
Bangladesh is so popular with companies, especially those that produce inexpensive clothes that need to be made quickly. The rock bottom, cheapest place in the world to make apparel. It's cheap because it has the lowest minimum wage for apparel workers in any country in the world, 18 cents an hour. That's about $38 a month. But it goes both ways. Garments are just as important to Bangladesh, accounting for 80% of its exports and giving jobs to 4 million people, mostly poor women. That gives the industry enormous leverage inside the country. So what they do is the retailers and buyers come here to look for the cheaper suppliers. So here is the deficit buyer's market. Everybody share. Everybody take the uh, share of the cake. So these are formally we have five to six players, but there are uh, many hands with these players who are taking all this stuff. It's not just the multinationals. In Bangladesh, everyone wants a shot at making it in the garment industry. I'm headed to a small factory that does finishing of garments. They're supposed to be finishing garments for Walmart. I'm posing as a buyer for yeah. there. For those who can't open large factories, there's always business in subcontracting. Even if it means putting the finishing touches on garments before they're shipped out. Do you make anything that ends up in Walmart? You make products to go to Walmart. Uh, Were you an authorized Walmart subcontractor? Uh, so is this very common that a lot of factories subcontract for big labels like Walmart without authorization? So this is a time 
that actually said for us to make this product. Oh my gosh. So see that how critical is the supply chain is? How critical is this? Jack declined to give us an on-camera interview. They did give us a statement though, saying the products we found were quote, either counterfeit or improperly acquired. But through the barcodes on the tags we found at the finishing house, we were able to match the garments to ones at Old Navy stores in the U.S. Gap added that it, quote, strictly prohibits any vendor from employing underage workers. There's a fairy tale that major brands and retailers like Gap and Walmart tell to the public. In this fairy tale, Gap and Walmart are companies that are socially responsible and deeply committed to protecting the rights of workers and making every effort to inspect their factories and ensure that everything is on the other. That fairy tale has very little to do with the reality of the supply chain. For Walmart, for Gap, worker rights issues are not a moral issue. They're an issue of reputational risk. And Walmart and Gap understand that their image in the eyes of the public has a very large impact on the degree to which they can get people to come to their stores and buy their goods. And so to the extent that they can be convinced that their image will be damaged if they don't do the right thing for workers, then they will make change. Kalpana Akhtar, a workers' rights activist, is still haunted by what she saw that day. It's a feeling that when you are in the inside the building, you can feel that how these workers fought to remove this window bar, the adjustment bar, to, and the jump. In my feeling was like, nothing can be worse than this. Nothing can be worse than this. Like seeing these people burn to ash, and the family crying in front of you, and they cannot find the, I mean, they cannot identify these bodies, whether is they are beloved or not. Nobody think about these this human faces who are making clothes for them and dying in these factories every day. Nobody talking about their compensation. Nobody talking about their wages that they pay. Even I would say even they don't even consider they are the human. But they are really human. They have needs. They have a voice. They want to speak up. They have right to have a safe working place. made in Bangladesh. And that's all we've got time for this week. Now, if you want to see that film again, please join us at the Rewind website. We can also leave your comments about this or any other program in the series. Otherwise, until next time. So I guess we got a sense of how complex the entire global apparel supply chain is. And again, as uh, Nova Scott from Workers' Rights Consortium in the documentary said that perhaps they made it intentionally complex so that we cannot trace who is responsible for what. But then again, this is just only part of the story. Bangladeshi workers are not necessarily passive victims of oppression by garment factory owners by transnational corporations. They are resisting in creative ways. And sometimes they're facing obstacles and sometimes they're coming up with creative solutions. So um, let's hear from Taslima Akhtar, who has been organizing in Bangladesh for, for what is wrong? Anyway, so can you hear me now? Okay, all right. So yeah, Taslima Akhtar has been organizing in Bangladesh for so many years. So um, yeah, Taslima, would you like to share some of your experiences? Hello everybody, I'm Taslima from Bangladesh. Um, today I'm going to tell you a story about some young girls and boys who sew your t-shirt. 
uh, from Bangladesh. Maybe uh, some of you know about the name Bangladesh. Uh, maybe some of you know, don't know about the name, but uh, you get scope sometimes to see uh, the tag inside your T-shirt. And sometimes you found the tag made with made in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh, and in this country, more than four million workers are working as a garment worker, and they are very young, and 80% of their women. They are struggling for their minimum wage, safety, and trade union rights. Uh, the young girls and boys who are supposed to go school or uh, university, now they are uh, introducing with uh, thread, needles, and lots of machines um, where they supposed to go to school or university. They are very young. Uh, by stitching different international brands with T-shirt and different other clothes like uh, Walmart, H&M, Zara, and also they stitch made in Bangladesh with this T-shirt, and they become the part of globalization. I think this is very uh, important for all of us that maybe we don't know about Bangladesh, maybe we don't know much more about Bangladeshi garment workers, but they are making the uh, big part of uh, clothes and garment products for Europe and American consumer. Um, when I am here, this is a very crucial time for our Bangladeshi garment workers. Our government declared new minimum wage and the garment workers, they were uh, doing a struggle, a movement for raising their wage because uh, the government declared a new minimum wage which is only $95. And Bangladeshi garment workers, they demanded $190 as a gross minimum wage for per month. But uh, government suddenly declared this new minimum wage on 13th September when I, were, I am in uh, uh, USA. And uh, this is very crucial time because uh, usually in our uh, country, our government owner who think that uh, the garment workers, they are like uh, number, they are not human being, they don't have dream, they don't have uh, uh, family like all of us. So they can only make profit for owners, they can only make profit for the international brands buyer. So they think they don't need uh, proper wage, they don't need safety, uh, they don't need the rights through that they can express their freedom of expression. So they always try to take hard line when minimum wage movement come. Maybe you can remember 1911, when a fire broke out uh, in Triangle Sweater in Manhattan. Now it's a part of New York University. That time more than uh, 145 workers died and most of them were uh, immigrant, migrant uh, workers. And I think that time uh, workers felt that they don't need any more tragedy or dead things they need to organize themselves because uh, if they want to say something about safety, about workers' rights, they have to organize themselves. They have to unionize themselves. So uh, that time also uh, this uh, issue evolved when um, Triangle Sweater happened. And in our country, uh, you have already saw the film, uh, in 2012 there was a fire broke out inside Tazreen and more than 111 workers di died. And that time, as an activist, as a photographer, I thought that this is the biggest thing. And when Rana Plaza collapse happened after just five months, and that Rana Plaza collapse incident crossed all the limit because more than 1,000 workers died. And it's a big incident in the whole industrial history. Uh, if anyone asks me uh, about my experience,
Like I'm working as, a, as an activist and a photo photographer for the last 11 years, and I'm documenting uh, garment workers' life and struggle. And also from our organization, Bangladesh Garment Workers Solidarity, we are trying to raise our, uh, some issue like uh, wage, safety, and trade union. But when anyone asks about uh, the condition of garment workers, sometimes we mention about Rana Plaza, Tazreen, because these are the biggest event and many workers died. Maybe it's so much sensitive things. But I think that we don't need to look at back always Rana Plaza or Tazreen. When you will uh, go to look at young girls and boys' faces, uh, when they work uh, two or three years in a factory, they lost their uh, uh, beauty from their face. They become so pale because uh, they're facing and suffering for malnutrition and other things. They all the time sacrifice their calorie, they sacrifice um, to send their kids school. So they are fighting for uh, development of our country, development of international brands buyer, but they are sacrificing their life all the moment. So you don't need to see all the time the dead bodies. If you just see the, the faces of young girls and boys, they look like much more old, I think, uh, in their face. And their face uh, will tell you more stories. You don't need more information, more data as for how is their living condition. So their living condition is very poor, all of we know that. And I think for Rana Plaza um, incident, and it's a structural killing uh, for this thing, and the, for the poor wage, uh, the responsible person is Bangladeshi owner, Bangladeshi government, at the same time, international brands and buyer, because they are taking the lion part of the profit. So I think that uh, uh, we need to organize uh, Bangladeshi garment workers locally, and we should make a um, strong solidarity bridge uh, globally, because it's not a local issue, it's a global issue. Uh, I think uh, today's talk will help us to make this uh, solidarity stronger. So uh, I want to show you now a few of my works. Uh, as a photographer, I uh, documented few things uh, I want to share you. Uh, she is Millie. Uh, she was a worker of uh, Rana Plaza. Uh, she lost her husband in the rubble. Uh, I took few photos from 2008 to 2012 to understand the workers' living condition and what they are uh, feeling inside the factory and outside the factory. Usually when any protest uh, starts in street, uh, our owners or administration of factory, they locked other factory workers that they couldn't go and attend uh, the protest. I know of a uh, strong uh, character, her name is Lisa. She, she made this and uh, she uh, said to me that she wanted to be uh, an artist, but now she is working inside a factory. Usually garment workers, they have to rent one room and have to share with all family members. In 2000, Eight, uh, military government took power in our country, and everybody was so afraid to say something. Freedom of expression was restricted at that time, but uh, the government workers, they were not afraid to raise their voice. She is Salma. Um, she died because um, her fellow workers, they were protesting for uh, Salma's compensation and other things. She was trying to go back home because she was feeling so bad when she was inside the factory and they denied to go him. Um, when Salma go back to uh, home, uh, she died. This is from 2010. Um, 
I was trying to follow uh, workers' life, uh, their daily life, their struggle. And after a few years, I tried to collect few photos from their family, mem family albums and try to understand how a documentary photographer see the reality and what is the dream. Because nobody wants to show their bad things in front of all. Everybody wants to show themselves in a very, very dignified way. So I tried to collect few photos, which photos they uh, taken from local studio. Uh, you see the backdrop. Uh, most of the backdrop is not real. Uh, maybe their dream is to go someplace and they choose these kinds of backdrop. These are from Rana Plaza Collapse. I've taken this photo from a medical morgue and of uh, parents, they were looking for their beloved daughter's dead body, decomposed dead body. All of you know about this photo, I don't want to say much more. After two years, we, from our garment organization, we published a book uh, a 480 page compiled book on Rana Plaza with dead and missing workers stories, the missing list. And Nafisa also worked for this uh, book. I want to give a special thank. And this is the book. We have collected few posters from family members when the collapse happened that time, uh, they hang these posters. And I started to collect family photos again. Uh, she is Shahida, she also died, but she is not in front of Sea Beach. It is just manipulated uh, photo. And this way they sometimes want to fulfill their dream. Uh, last year we launched a website uh, on Rana Plaza Collapse. Um, so if you are interested, you can find some stories from this website. And this is also another book. Uh, it's a photo book named Lives Not Numbers. And this is Triangle Sweater. Few days back, I met uh, Robin Burson, who is a very great artist, quilter, and historian. She made two quilts uh, to remember uh, triangle sweaters, dead workers. Uh, on 100th anniversary of a triangle sweater, she made this powerful uh, quilt and she collected photos from old newspaper and she made the quilt and she uh, gave some special effect with the quilt and try to give them honor with this. And after Rana Plaza, she started to collect photos from Tazreen and Rana Plaza workers. And she made another quilt, Robin Burson made another quilt to show her honor to Bangladeshi garment workers. And somehow Robin inspired me a lot and from our organization, Bangladesh Garment Solidarity, when we are, uh, we are going to observe the fifth anniversary of Rana Plaza, collapse. That time we thought we will make a quilt, but not in an American way, in a very typical traditional Bangladeshi way. So maybe you know in Bangladesh there is a very uh, common tradition of Nokshi Katha and different kind of stitching quilt. Usually uh, women stitch quilts and they uh, gift it to their beloved person uh, and to use it. Uh, so we think that maybe we can make different quill. And first the idea was not shape. We worked together with Rana Plaza survivors and dead family members. Actually they made the original quill, small quills. Then we put it on local towel called gamcha. That gamcha is uh, made by hand loom machine. And we collected few quills from dead workers family and two from my family, one my mother gifted me 30 years ago. And we put all these small quilts on gamcha, then on big quilt, 
that we collected from dead family members and my family. After the talk, I think if you have time, you can see two quills outside. And this quilt is not an art piece only. This is more than art piece. Um, through this uh, collective work, uh, we want to say something special that we want justice for Bangladeshi garment workers. We want justice uh, for workers who are um, struggling for their wage. And I asked one mother about her feeling, and she feels so good, so proud that she take part of this uh, quilt making. At the same time, she felt so bad because she is uh, swinging on her own son's uh, photo. Through this quilt, we try to give some special message to Bangladeshi people, Bangladeshi workers and international consumers also that we should change this uh, condition of workers, but for this we need to organize them, and which is very difficult in our country. And our government owner, they embrace Rana Plaza. When Rana Plaza happened, they feel shaky, they feel maybe they are cornered, they will not get some more order from uh, Europe and American market. That time they give scope to activists to do some protests and other things. But uh, when workers raise voice for wage, that time they took hard line. So they are not embracing any more Rana Plaza incident. So we need to think in a new way how uh, we can um, fight this situation because um, I think um, uh, it is very important uh, to work together locally and globally. So uh, thank you for coming today. And I, ho I hope Elora uh, uh, will say something about uh, Bangladeshi government workers. And we will find some way how we can uh, take initiative uh, for those young girls and boys who are making our clothes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Taslima Akhtar, for this amazing narrative of your work and um, struggle and organizing experiences of Bangladeshi garment workers. So I guess now the question is what it means for us to look at these photos and get a sense of lives and struggles of third world women. How those images circulate transnationally and the kind of meanings they circulate across borders. So I would like to invite Professor Ilora Chaudhary to reflect on um, some of Taslim Akhtar's work. I'm just trying to find my um, folder.
So um, thank you. I'd uh, just like to begin by thanking um, Professor Tanjim for organizing this event today and um, inviting me to be a part of it. I'm really humbled to be here in the company of um, Taslima Akhtar and uh, Nafisa Tanjim. Uh, both of them have uh, been engaged in such critical activist and uh, research work for a very long time. Um, and it's, it's really an honor to be here to um, talk a little bit about my own um, work in relation um, to the topic of the panel today. So uh, just to give you a little bit of context, um, I, my research is uh, animated by broad questions around transnational feminist organizing and solidarity practices. And I look at uh, questions like how do uh, campaigns for human rights, um, campaigns um, for violence against women in the global south enter the discourse of uh, transnational and global feminism? And how are concepts like uh, victimization and agency um, construed within these uh, frames of uh, neoliberalism or capitalism or global feminism or human rights? And how does narrative, um, that is the stories that we tell um, about victimhood and empowerment and agency um, shape our own feminist responses to understand um, extreme suffering. Uh, so I, I want to say that, you know, I have this photograph that was taken by Taslima Akhtar, um, the final embrace or death of a thousand dreams. I think um, it has a couple of different um, names and perhaps, you know, we can ask Taslima a little bit about that. Um, but how uh, engaging with this photograph um, allows us to think about some of the shifting notions of gender. Um, that frame ideas of progress, um, women's liberation, women's emancipation, and even oppression um, in the context of uh, Bangladesh. So just to go back a little bit, um, I think in recent decades in Bangladesh, we have seen a shift in um, the representations of um, womanhood. So uh, we are familiar with uh, discourses like um, scholarly discourses around um, ideal womanhood in the colonial context. So something that you know, historian Partha Chatterjee, for instance, talked about the ideal um, womanhood in the context of Bengal, which was sort of like the, the middle class um, femininity and often constructed directly in contrast to um, Western ideals of womanhood, but also um, working class um, and um, rural conceptions of femininity within the context of um, Bengal. We've also seen uh, that in post-independence Bangladesh, uh, there has been a lot of focus uh, when we talk about women's emancipation um, to associate that within the frames of development. So that, that, that sort of projecting images of uh, uplift, of progress, of um, women as economic agents. Um, and at the same time, we've also seen um, with the proliferation of um, the NGO sector, in particular in Bangladesh, and also the garment um, sector, um, other images of womanhood emerging. So the, 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 the construction of the new woman, which is sort of the modern liberated um, agent, um, who is both at once uh, the corner store of the domestic space, the family, but also um, someone who is more empowered in the public space through their participation in neoliberal um, schemes like um, NGOs and um, garment sector. So I'm j just trying to say here that these ideas of the new woman that we see in, the, in, in recent decades um, it's, it, 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 it's layered, and uh, we see competing notions of it. And um, it's a composite of many women, um, as uh, Sonia Nishat Amin, um, feminist scholar in Bangladesh, has talked about. So uh, in a way, what we call the new woman in this context is a 
paradox. She is both autonomous and self-reliant and economically productive. Um, at the same time, in transnational discourses, when we think about uh, the third world woman worker, um, we think about someone who's also simultaneously oppressed um, and um, engaged in menial work. So this bifurcated identity, I think, is something that really comes into sharp contrast when we uh, learn about um, the industrial disaster uh, like Rana Plaza, which really sort of brought into such uh, sharp focus uh, what was happening in the, in the context of um, w w women workers in the, in the global south. So um, with, with that background, I just uh, want to say that when we um, look at um, Taslima Akhtar's photographs, and particularly the death of a thousand dreams, uh, which was named as the most haunting depiction of the tragedy by the photo editors of Time, uh, we see that the photograph shows a man and a woman in an embrace, uh, what was uh, in the last moment of their lives. And we, um, and I'm talking about audiences in, in, in the West primarily here, uh, we don't really know who, who they are, um, whether um, the couple shared a relationship outside of this uh, death embrace. Um, perhaps uh, we can imagine that they sought comfort in their last moments, um, feeling a profound connection to each other, to humanity, um, as the, um, the plaster, steel, and concrete uh, came crushing, uh, crushing down on them like a deck of cards. So in depicting this um, intimate contact between a young man and a woman in an ostensibly public embrace, this image uh, defies many social and cultural norms that we come to associate um, with notions of gender and um, femininity and masculinity in, in Bangladesh. Uh, the enormity of what was about to happen perhaps made those considerations for modesty, shame, and honor immaterial. The man, as um, you can see, is seen to be covering the woman's torso in a protective embrace even as his own trauma is signified by blood, resembling a tear, um, a teardrop trickling down from the corner of his closed left eye. So uh, while I'm not minimizing the reality of um, male violence against women, which is how uh, gender-based violence is often uh, depicted primarily in the uh, context of Bangladesh or you know, in many parts of the global south, uh, but I'd also like to propose that this photograph poses a visual challenge to that narrative, that narrative of Western feminist, feminism, that the downtrodden third world female and her violent and oppressive male counterpart. I think it expands our understanding of um, gender-based violence be beyond this lens of male violence to one of structural violence. So um, that the, the, the whole, work of the industry that both Taslima and um, Nafisa were talking about earlier, uh, that uh, comes into play. And the structural violence, it offers us a visual schema that encourages an analytic of connectivity and intersectional and relational gender dynamics. So I think you know, you're well familiar with this whole notion of um, how visual media attends to spectacular violence occurring in, in the third world context. Um, and um, feminist scholar Lakshmi Murthy particularly, she um, likens this notion of the specter, spectacular attention to violence to um, historically what happened in the American South. And she um, juxtaposes sort of, you know, the, what, what photographs in, in that context, uh, historically in the American South during um, slavery, what photographs of lynchings um, uh, and really sort of these uh, very gruesome images of um, oppression uh, historically of African Americans in, in, in this country allowed um, us to do in terms of um, civil rights organizing. So. Um, looking at the, those spectacular uh, renditions of violence and educating uh, the public to sort of egregious acts of um, racial violence and um, the various power structures that contribute to it. So although we are looking at a very different context here, 
um, I think that photographs such as this also has obviously um, that kind of power to um, mobilize and to draw attention to um, abject um, context of, of, of violence. But also another uh, aspect that I want to highlight what photographs like this d d does is also think about um, gender uh, relations within um, a relational uh, framework. So drawing from the research of um, International Migrants Alliance Research Foundation, um, uh, I, I want to note here that hundreds of um, deaths occur um, every year um, among male li labor migrants in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia um, annually. So um, this research study shows that cardiac failure is cited as the most common cause of death um, among um, male um, migrant workers, which is quite surprising given uh, the younger age of many of these victims, um, usually ranging from uh, ages 30 to 45. Um, one of these studies um, by the International Center for Diarrheal Research um, in Bangladesh, ICDDRB, uh, in association with the International Organization of Migration, revealed that um, only 14% of male Bangladeshi migrant workers get medical assistance from their employers, although 70% of them have health problems. And a majority of the migrants are between the ages of 28 and 47 years of age, and almost half of them suffer from a variety of mental health problems, while about 60% experience some form of workplace um, injury. And of course, in the parallel context in Bangladesh, we've also seen um, the various um, deaths of workers, mostly women, in that context. So given the massive numbers of women workers in the garment industry, most of these deaths were of um, female employees. So these numbers tell the story of uh, the precarious conditions and vulnerabilities of both male and female uh, workers in, um, and the consequent gender differentiated stories from their struggles and deaths that circulate in transnational media and advocacy circuits. So we hear more about the women workers in that context um, because, you know, as um, many of you know, in, in sort of development framings, women uh, possess certain currency and, and uh, we don't at the same time uh, what, what, what is happening to male m migrant workers can also be seen as a form of structural violence. So I think that photographs such as this and the work that Taslima does also draws attention to um, that gender dynamic of structural inequality and violence in the, in the global south. So I wanted to show you another photograph, um, actually one that was taken by our very own um, Nafisa um, Tanjim here for her research. And what you see here um, is, uh, well, since the proliferation of garment factories in uh, Bangladesh and the steady stream of women workers flooding the cities of Dhaka um, have inspired and reaffirmed these stories of female autonomy and empowerment. Garment workers are referred to as the golden girls, replacing the golden fiber or jute, that uh, feminist scholar Dina Siddiqui has written about that from earlier decades. Um, they're the premier foreign currency earner for the nation. Uh, this euphoric sentiment is expressed in the nationalistic campaigns um, by the Bengali language uh, national daily newspaper, Prothomalo, uh, which inscribes ideas of national prog progress onto the body of the woman. So uh, one such poster um, that you're seeing on the screen here features a young woman in a white shalwar kameez and a green and red orna, which signifies um, the colors of the Bangladesh flag. The woman is wearing an expression of bold confidence and holding a tiffin box, uh, giving the impression of a person on their way to work. The backdrop shows what could be construed as a shop floor. The poster bears the following message. Um, uh, it, in, if I translate it, it, it means as long as the country is in your hands, Bangladesh will not lose its way. So this image puts the burden of the nation's progress on the hands of the new woman, who in this image is self-content and emblematic of national pride, 
but who bears little resemblance to the one that we have seen earlier um, in the photograph um, or many photographs of Taslima Akhtar. And so we want to ask the question, what is magnified here and um, what is obscured? Um, so in conclusion, um, I want to say that the death of a thousand dreams is one of the most startling and uh, publicized examples of um, the visibility in death and the value and expendability of workers in the garment industry in Bangladesh. Um, and uh, that the image is also instrumental in opening a conversation about the necessity of an ethical engagement um, with human catastrophe, such as um, the Rana Plaza, that we need to sort of engage with this narrative of the new woman um, and, um, and how sort of artistic abstractions of um, social objections um, can also be about a political project, that the new woman is a dutiful worker dependent on wages who is not ultimately self-sufficient nor autonomous, um, bound as she is within the logic of um, autonomy through capitalist advancement. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaudhuri, for your very important critical reflection on the construction of new women and how those images travel across borders and the kind of implications it has on um, creation and circulation of images of third world women. So um, in, in my brief reflection, I would like to talk a little bit about the history of labor movement in Bangladesh and the kind of relationship it has with the growing NGOization of labor movement and how we can actually situate, it, situate the ongoing garment labor organizing against this context. So if you look at the history of Bangladesh and a little history lesson for you and many of you probably already know about it, Bangladesh or um, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, it used to be Indian subcontinent before 1947 and it was ruled by the British colonial rulers um, who were there for 200 years. So they left the country in 1947 and divided the Indian subcontinent into two countries, India and Pakistan. So Bangladesh used to be East Pakistan and it was part of Pakistan at that time. So we are talking about 1950s and 1960s and again local politics is very much tangled with global politics so that's the time of post-Second World War, Cold War. So all these countries were divided into capitalist bloc and socialist bloc, and the Pakistan government subscribed to the capitalist bloc. And the very interesting thing about labor organizing in Bangladesh is traditionally labor organizing um, was done by people who were also participating in nationalist and anti-colonial struggles. So the idea is that when you organize labor, you just don't talk about workers. You also talk about challenging the government. You also talk about participating, participating in il election and establishing democracy, things like that. So left-leading socialist organizers have been organizing labor in Bangladesh um, for a really long, long period of time. However, as I said, the Pakistan government subscribed to the capitalist bloc and it banned the Communist Party in Bangladesh in 1954. It banned trade unionizing in 1958. So labor unionizing was officially banned um, in East Pakistan and in Pakistan in general. And Bangladesh got its independence in 1971 and then it became an independent nation. And the newly Form framed nation um, initially it subscribed to the socialist bloc. And the idea was that, you know, I mean, you, you subscribe to the socialist bloc, and uh, the country was backed by the Soviet Union, they nationalized the industry, and the idea was that it will emancipate all workers and everything will be nice and fine. However, that idea didn't sustain. Bangladesh was one of the 35 countries that had to implement structural adjustment policies starting from 1980s. 
and the governments were forced to open its border and invite transnational capital. And at the same time, all those transnational corporations were looking for cheap labor. So Bangladesh seemed to be an ideal place to go and invest. And that's when we see a huge boom in the garment industry. And as Professor Chudri was pointing out, and um, Akhtar also reflected on it, garment industry was considered as um, a sector where women can get engaged in paid work and they can earn money and they can have more decision making power in their families so they can resist patriarchy. However, that's a really controversial point because if you look at their working condition, yes, they are operating in an exploitative environment. Uh, they are working for up to 12 to 14 hours. They're not getting their benefits. And then again, just getting involved in paid employment doesn't necessarily ensure that you are empowered. So left-leaning organizers um, who kind of subscribe to socialist alternatives started organizing in Bangladesh again. Um, for a long, long period of time, they had to stay underground because of suppression from the government, but they were organizing in many different ways. And they were challenging governments and they were organizing workers. But again, we need to look at the global politics of labor organizing, and that's when um, the role of the United States kind of comes in. So you have probably heard about AFL-CIO, that's, the, that's the, the huge national umbrella of labor unions in the United States, and it also operates through a nonprofit organization called Solidarity Center. And in 1990s, Solidarity Center was trying to establish an alternative way of labor organizing that won't be subscribing to socialist politics. So they were trying to fund workers in the global south and they were trying to teach workers how to organize. So in 1990s, they came to Bangladesh and they started working with Bangladeshi workers, garment workers, and specifically young women garment workers to teach them how to organize and how to build up a kind of labor movement that doesn't necessarily subscribe to socialist policies. So they initiated an organization, it's called Bigoof, back in 1993, and they recruited a number of young women garment workers. They taught them English, they taught them labor laws, they taught them how to negotiate with garment factory owners, and they also started funding their initiative. So that was a really new concept in the context of Bangladesh, getting funding for doing social justice work. So if you look at how social justice activism took place in Bangladesh back in 1960s, 1780s, people mostly did it voluntarily. So the idea was that you know you care for something, you go out and you volunteer your time. But starting from 1990s, the very new idea came in where you can get paid for doing social justice work. Social justice work can be your 9 to 5 p.m. job. What are the good things about it? Yes, you're getting resources. You can um, get engaged full time. Uh, you don't have to worry about getting uh, money for supporting your family and you can do what you care about. What are the downsides? And then again, you're getting funding from Solidarity Center, funding coming from the United States. So you can only do that kind of work until that funding sustains. So that raised a huge critical question of how much sustainable this specific model is. And also the kind of labor organizing they're teaching those young new women. And in the Al Jazeera video, you saw that at the end of the documentary, um, a labor rights organizer, Kalpuna Akhtar, she was talking about her organizing and how she felt about multinational cooperation. So Kalpuna Akhtar, BCWS, all these organizations were basically trained by Solidarity Center. They taught them English and as I said, they taught them how to bargain with garment factory owners. And um, they were not necessarily a fan of civil disobedience. So the idea is that you have to sit in a table and you have to negotiate with garment factory workers, you have to speak their language, and you don't do civil disobedience. And also they couldn't do it because they were receiving funding from those North American labor organizing groups. And in order to get funding, you have to register your organization as an NGO. And when you are an NGO in Bangladesh, you are obliged to follow the local rules and regulations. So yes, you can only sit on a table and talk to government factory owners, and you cannot necessarily organize a strike. You cannot do civil disobedience, nonviolent movement. But if you look at the history of labor organizing in Bangladesh, you will see that all of the major landmark achievements mostly came through 
civil disobedience. Sometimes those initiatives of civil disobedience were peaceful, sometimes they were violent, but then again, civil disobedience, that's an integral part of labor movement in Bangladesh. And another thing that we need to think about is how the priorities of garment factory workers were shaped in those very neoliberal kind of social organizing. So after the Rana Plaza collapse, many northern labor rights organizers, um, organizations like ILRF, WRC, Clean Clothes Campaign, Makula Solidarity Network, they thought that no, something is going really, really wrong in Bangladesh. And um, I'm using Professor Chiodo as some spectacular violence. So they were responding to certain incidents that happened, Rana Plaza, Tazreen Factory Fire. They're not necessarily thinking about everyday struggles. So they thought about, oh, we need to ensure building on fire safety. So they start to give huge amount of money to local NGOs, labor NGOs, to run consciousness awareness raising campaigns, to work with local and global actors, so that they can push local factory workers, um, local um, factory owners, to ensure safety and security in their factories, which was definitely important. Safety and security, I mean, these are really crucial things in the context of Bangladesh. But when I did my work, and also many of scholars have pointed out that if you ask a garment worker what it means by safety, most of them would respond that I'm not getting paid enough. I need to put food on my table. Whenever I'm sick, I need to see a doctor. So exclusively focusing on building and fire safety doesn't necessarily address the holistic need, everyday needs of a worker. So the interesting thing is the labor NGOs that were funded by North American labor organizing initiatives exclusively focus on ensuring building and fire safety. And even they talked about safety, they translated safety in a very, very technocratic term. It was about how many exits uh, does a factory have? Um, is your fire door strong? But they didn't necessarily talk about the necessity of having minimum wage, um, updating labor laws. They didn't necessarily talk about protection from sexual harassment and things like that wherever local garment workers, I mean, they interpreted safety in a very different way. So the kind of organizing Taslim Akhtar's organization does, I would say it's very, very organic. And the interesting thing is um, they consciously avoid all kinds of transnational funding. So they would never apply for funding to any labor NGO. And it has its strong side and not so strong sides. So strong sides are uh, the kind of work that Taslim Akhtar and a number of grassroots labor organizers do in Bangladesh, they can determine their priority. They are not necessarily waiting for getting funding. They are um, involved with some really passionate, hardworking grassroots organizers. Uh, they are free in, in to, to determine what they want to do. So they are doing everything in their own terms. What are the limitations? Resources. Their scope is very, very limited. They can't necessarily run long-term sustaining um, projects because again, I mean, you need to feed those people. And these are poor garment workers who need to work outside. And they're organizing perhaps part-time, perhaps voluntarily, and resources. I mean, that's a really critical thing for those grassroots organizing initiatives. And then again, if you look at what those labor NGOs are doing, their scopes are really broad. They have huge amount of money. They can reach out to many, many garment workers. And most importantly, they can work with their transnational networks. And again, you watched the Al Jazeera documentary, and it talked about how complex the entire apparel supply chain is. So you can necessarily address the supply chain by only challenging the local garment factory owners. Yes, they are part of the story, but there are other actors as well. So if you want to challenge those transnational actors, you have to go transnational. But the challenge is you can only go transnational if you, in the context of Bangladesh, if you operate as an NGO, if you register yourself as an NGO, and you say to the government that, yes, we're going to apply by all the rules and regulations. That means that you, know, I mean, you can't necessarily resist government policies straightforwardly. You have to speak their language. You have to kind of subscribe to a certain kind of polit politics. You can't be radical. So that's a really critical question that shapes current moods of transnational solidarity building initiatives. And this is perhaps we all need to think about, like what are the possibilities? Do you really have to like seek funds and work 
as a traditional NGO, is it really possible for you to work as an NGO and not necessarily subscribe uh, to the mainstream politics of benevolent neoliberal organizing? Can you really sustain grassroots organizing without getting involved with transnational organizing initiatives? So yes, I mean, there is no answer, but grassroots organizers all over the world are trying to sort it out. So I guess that's it from me. Um, I'm going to open the floor for a Q&A, but just um, uh, two interesting pieces of info for you. We are ho uh, the quills that the Slim Actor has been talking about, two of the quills are displayed outside. So after the event, you can go out and have a look at the quills. And we will also be hosting a photo exhibition by Taslim Akhtar here at the Marin Art Gallery from next week. So you can come and drop by and have a look at the powerful work that Taslim Akhtar has done. So let's open the floor for Q&A and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Um, yes. Anyone have any questions or comments or? How does this impact women's rights? Um, in our country, uh, there are a few women organizations. Uh, in women organizations, there are the same problems, uh, what um, Nafisa mentioned. Some women organizations are very much involved with NGO, they are dependent uh, with foreign fund. They are active when fund comes. When they don't have any fund, they are not active. And, um, but there are a few uh, women organizations, they are progressive and they are doing something, uh, but still they are not strong enough, I think, because if we want em women's e emancipation, then we need to involve ourselves with working class women, because the big part of women are from working class. So when uh, women movement uh, become limited with the middle class, it couldn't do much more, I think. So, a uh, few days ago, uh, not few days, like, like it's, it, it was about in 2016, end of the 2016, garment workers, they, are, uh, they were uh, raising some issue about their some factory demands and uh, their increasing minimum wage. That time we said that this uh, wage issue is also a women issue because a big part of uh, garment workers are women. So the women uh, activists, they should say something, they should talk something, they should uh, show their uh, solidarity with workers. But we still not uh, seeing this kinds of movement in our country. Uh, still the women's movement is very much limited with middle class uh, people. But I think the uh, garment workers who are the biggest part of our country now, um, now they are raising voice for wage, uh, safety, trade union rights. But uh, these issues are also related with the democratic transition issue of our country. And they will not raise their voice only for wage only for trade union. I think they will raise issue for their women's rights. I think very soon we will see this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hello. I'd like to thank you all for um, you know, speaking upon what you've learned about and um, all the work you've done. I very much appreciate it. And I had a question about, um, you know, aside from the events that are happening in Bangladesh, how do you see these things happen in Bangladeshi communities around the world? Um. Um, 
mean to, to say that how the issue of labor organizing is being taken up by various communities, or Bangladeshi communities around the world? Or, or just sort of, you know, how they're perceived by... Um, yeah, so more specifically, I was thinking about the terms of um, migration, if there has been any, um, and um, in certain parts of the world, you know, you could find very concentrated areas of Bangladeshi communities. So I'm wondering, you know, how these have um, how these problems have crossed like transnational borders and um, how communities have responded, if, if any. Right, I think, um, you know, and, and at one level when we talk about the work of garment industry and um, migrant workers in Bangladesh and specifically, you know, there's a huge labor migration occurring from Bangladesh to um, Gulf Arab states also, so sort of, you know, in, in, in that region. Um, the conversation often occurs around remittance, right? So that this is, um, just as um, the garment industry is one of the leading generators of foreign currency, um, the migrant workers' remittances is also another leading generators of foreign currency for the country. So at the national level, the conversation is often framed as, as progress, that, um, that th this is lucrative, that this is good for the nation, and, um, the, and women in particular are um, agents of economic change and social change in the country. So we, you know, there's a national narrative that we feel proud of um, what women um, have achieved for themselves and also for the country. Um, but of course, that sort of, a, you know, one level of um, analysis and um, what it, it doesn't show is, is sort of the day-to-day -day realities and um, you know, th there are researches that will uh, that suggest that with the advent of neoliberal schemes like the garment um, industry, also the microcredit um, industry in Bangladesh is another one um, that shifting gen gender rela relations have also shown increase in terms of um, gender-based violence. So. Um, that's, that's a narrative that we don't often focus on, particularly, you know, when we are talking about uh, workers and migration um, around the world. Hi. Um, so often we are very quick to uh, boycott companies and um, companies, uh, and often, most of the time, the people who get hurt most are the workers in other countries rather than the companies that we're trying to hold accountable. Um, now, my question is, from a per yeah, yeah, for, from a, a Western um, perspective and from someone who lives in the United States, how can we help these communities, um, especially with the restrictions that they have in the country, um, actually gain more rights um, yeah. Uh, I don't think that uh, boycott is a solution because uh, I think all of you agree with this because uh, if we start boycotting uh, buying clothes from Bangladesh then the industry will collapse and the workers will lose their job. So I don't think this is a solution if we feel our responsibility uh, as a citizen, as a consumer of these products, I think uh, who are the consumer, they can give pressure on international brands, buyer, uh, to ensure the wage, because they're all the time looking for the cheapest labor. They just want to make profit. They don't uh, aware about the safety and other things. If they give uh, um, more scent for each t-shirt, maybe that will create a uh, good condition for workers. So as a consumer, you can do many things if you want. 
because I saw after Rana Plaza collapse uh, from different corner of the world, different uh, citizens, uh, cultural activists, they are doing different activism to make pressure on brand spire. So uh, it depends on you what you actually want to do. Then you can find the way, I think. And uh, if you want to support any organization, any individual, maybe in our country, there are, we all the time face lots of problem. Like um, as an activist, we have to face uh, different legal issues because all the time owners fire workers, they file um, cases against uh, workers, so we need legal support. Sometimes um, we have to take a worker to hospital and we have to organize fund and many things. And we saw the, their children also have enough possibility to do different things, but they don't have enough money. So it about you what way you want to support or be a part of this movement. If you want to support them, maybe it uh, create a limit. If you want to be a part of this movement, then it's different way. So you have to choose your own way. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's a fascinating question. And again, you are asking a question that is very, very structural in nature. And I guess the solution should also be very, very structural. So on one hand, yes, as um, Akhtar pointed out, that boycott movement doesn't always work because we are thinking that okay, and North American consumers have all kind of power and then they can just boycott it and then corporations will change their mind. So first of all, if you boycott Walmart, are you rich enough to pay for a sweat-free product? Many of our consumers are not that rich. Um, the second thing is you are boycotting say for example Walmart, but do you know that the other products that you are buying are also sweat-free? And the third thing is and that's the problem with transnational organizing across the supply chain. We are only focusing on the garment industry in Bangladesh, but most of the women, they're doing reproductive work and productive work, and more than 90% of them are involved in the informal sector. They work as domestic workers. Uh, they work as, in the construction. Some of them work in the sex industry. So what about those women? They are not producing any products for you, so does it mean that we shouldn't care about them? So yes, I mean, these are the problems of organizing a boycott movement. What can you do? Again, as I said, the solution has to be structural. So I don't know if you know about this organization called United Students Against Sweatshop. It's a fabulous student organization. They have more than 180 chapters all across the United States, and they organize students on campus so that students can question their administration about whether they're sourcing from sweat-free sources, the kind of collegiate apparel that you buy, whether it exploited labor or not. So maybe we can have a Leslie USAS chapter. That might be one way to address this. Um, the other thing is to get in touch with organizers like Taslim Akhtar. I mean, they just came up, they, they, Akhtar talked about a website that they worked on, and it, it, it um, uploaded narratives of Rana Plaza survivors, and they're looking for volunteers who can translate those stories. So if you know more than one language, get in touch with them. I mean, volunteer your time. Then it will help with translation, then it will help with designing websites and things like that. And circulate those stories on social media. Make other peers conscious about what's going on. These are the things that you can do. And again, um, when you think of voting, I mean, I guess most of you are like um, above 18 see the kind of relationship your senator has with multinational corporations. Are they ex getting resources? Are they getting funding from those corporations? How aware are they about protecting workers' rights? I mean, you can hold your senator liable, and that will definitely have a long-term impact on addressing all those structural violence in different layers of the apparel supply chain. We have time for one more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, uh, you know one of the questions you already answered about this uh, um, boycotting, and I was part of the group of people who were organizing here during Rana Plaza, and there was a lot of debate back and forth between this boycott versus not boy non boycott, and I still think it's still pretty murky. 
I mean, uh, to not completely, I mean, sometimes when you call for a boycott, you are really not going to be able to bring down a Walmart or an H&M, but it acts as a tool in your toolkit to put pressure on the, uh, you know, on, on the chain or on the uh, corporation. So completely, I, I don't know, again, it's not, a, I'm not saying it's a black and white, but it's a very murky uh, area to, uh, and one should maybe think more about how to, uh, you know, na navigate uh, that question of boycotting or not boycotting or having some other more, uh, you know, maybe more sophisticated methods of putting pressure on on the uh, corporations. That's one part, and I think you have already addressed some of it. Um, the second question is: I am also from the other half of Bengal in India. And, and, you know, Bangladesh and uh, India now are like <laughs> a whole new politics is emerging around calling all people Bangladeshi and denigrating the term, term Bangladeshi uh, to be, you know, associating them to be like foreigners, intruders, and that's the politics of the Hindu right that is in power right now. So do, do you have, if you can just, uh, you know, reflect a little bit on the kind of solidarity you think the western part of uh, Bengal can do for, uh, with the workers of Bangladesh. Well, I, I think that um, from what I have read about this phenomenon in um, India and West Bengal, um, the identity Bangladesh is also associated with Muslim and a threat and therefore the sort of eradication of all Bangladeshis back to Bangladesh, it also, you know, um, brings in that, that kind of coded um, political meaning. So I, I think, you know, in, in terms of solidarity practices, if you're talking about um, workers' rights, I think, you know, as Nafisa's work shows, there are many ways to um, collaborate across borders, and that's actually essential in terms of grassroots organizing. And in, in the context of the region of the, um, South Asia itself, I think that also requires sort of a broader and uh, historical engagement with these categories, identity categories. I mean, it goes back hundreds of years. We've also seen recent, recent, in more recent um, times with the Rohingya refugee um, situation. I think also in, in India, there are about 40,000 Rohingya um, refugees, and, and they've also been called into question, and they've also been labeled as terror threats and um, been asked to leave, basically, by the um, Indian government. So th there, there are um, ways to bring attention to um, these phenomena that are occurring across borders in South Asia, but also how they link up to sort of global um, politics, um, geopolitically, and, um, you know, really look back in our own history that how these borders are um, so arbitrary and politically driven, and how um, the, the shared histories in, in the region um, are really to be drawn out to think about, well, what does a citizen mean in, in, in these contexts? So I think, you know, um, maybe um, having those kinds of conversations about citizenship uh, beyond sort of national borders is um, one area that, uh, that comes into um, mind. And I, I study uh, film and narrative and, you know, I, I think about uh, films that, that, that have um, brought out these questions of um, identity and, and connections across regions and politics and, um, you know, it, it's very powerful, I think, in terms of raising awareness and also questioning sort of the current uh, formulations of identity. 
all right so our time is up so thank you everyone for your time and for your commitment to such an important social justice issue um, thank you professor Ilora Choudhury and Taslima Akhtar um, for joining us and I would like to also uh, extend my thanks to the class dean's office and the office of diversity council for supporting us a special thanks to Bon Guan for making it happen. She has been working tirelessly since last two weeks and we couldn't have done it without you. So thank you everyone and just a reminder that we will be hosting an exhibition of Taslim Akhtar's photo from next week at the Marin Art Gallery so feel free to drop by. Um, and also we are displaying the quills outside so please have a look. There's a small reception outside so please grab some bites and thank you again.